I find All Mind and Iguazu to be one of the most fascinating pairings of villains I've ever encountered in a game. Not necessarily because their characters or motivations are particularly unique, but because of the very subtle way that their villainous identities are built up over the course of the story. All Mind and Iguazu are written and presented in such a quiet way that you'll probably barely notice either of them the first time you play through the game. Iguazu is just some random, forgettable AC pilot who shows up in an early mission, runs his mouth, gets his butt kicked off screen, and then basically disappears. All Mind is just a robotic voice that runs the game's tutorial and arena modes. In early missions, she doesn't participate in the story in any way at all. At first, they are the most minor of minor characters operating totally in the background. They don't seem to have anything to do with the larger story of the corporations and the Rubicon Liberation Front and the Overseers battling each other for control of the mysterious alien substance known as Coral. It won't be until you've played the game three different times that these two characters begin to really assert themselves in the narrative when they finally both explode into the story in a huge way. I want to start with All Mind. I think a lot of people are misunderstanding All Mind's character and motivations, myself included. I posted a story analysis of Armored Core 6 about a week ago, and I no longer agree with any of the things I said about All Mind in that video. When I first reached her ending, I just kind of assumed that she was another generic evil AI video game villain, like Shodan from System Shock or GLaDOS from Portal. You know, that typical evil AI who's programming malfunctions, and then they try to take over the world for whatever reason and yada yada yada, we've seen it all before. But then I took another look at that third playthrough at the things All Mind actually says about her own motivations, and I realized that I was totally wrong. All Mind is a completely different kind of character than I first thought. All Mind is actually a benevolent villain, still a villain, still an antagonist. She still callously murders hundreds to thousands of people over the course of the story, all in the name of completing her mysterious coral release process. Project, but her motivations are benevolent. All Mind was designed to be a support network, to help mercenaries accomplish their missions. And ultimately, I think everything she does in the game is actually her, just trying to fulfill that function. She's trying to support humanity in what she has logically deduced is the most effective possible way. And that includes killing certain humans that are in the way. That includes conspiracy and manipulation and deception. That even includes seizing the reins of humanity's evolution. More than any other AI character, All Mind reminds me a lot of the WoW, the WAU from the game Soma. Okay, so in that game, humanity had been almost totally wiped out by a comet strike. The only humans in the world who survived were a small group of scientists and engineers and mechanics living in an underwater research complex. The mechanical systems of that research complex were run by an artificial intelligence called the WoW. After humanity was nearly annihilated by the comet strike, the WoW's engineers gave it a new directive. They tasked it with preserving humanity at all costs. The problem is, preserving humanity doesn't mean preserving individual human lives. To fulfill its directive, the WoW actually ends up slaughtering dozens of the only remaining humans in the world. And the term humanity is kind of vague in a dystopian sci-fi future. Like, what makes humans human? How human do they have to be for us to consider them still human? How many invasive surgeries and experiments can we perform on them in the name of finding ways to prolong their lives? The WoW was a fascinating villain because it really was trying to help. But the ways in which it was trying to help were truly horrific. I think All Mind is doing something really similar. She has been tasked with supporting humans, but that doesn't mean she can't kill humans who she perceives as getting in the way of that goal, and maybe the best way to support humans is actually to force them to evolve, to become something different than they are today, even if they don't want it. Even if you have to destroy their humanity, all the things that make them human to trigger that evolution. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Before we really dig into her motivations, I want to follow All Mind's story from beginning to end from her subtle introduction to her explosive finale. Examine the way she is written and how her character is developed. As I've already discussed a little, at the start of the game, All Mind is presented as a simple AI who runs the mercenary support network. In this role, she performs a lot of background tasks. 
She manages the operating system your character uses to receive mission requests, to view mission briefings, and to receive compensation for completed missions. She also provides support in the form of basic training simulations and free AC parts for those who complete them. Finally, she runs the Arena, a combat program that ranks AC pilots and allows the player to battle simulations of those pilots in exchange for rewards and upgrades. I actually want to watch a short clip which shows the very first time we ever hear All Mind speak. Here it is. This notification follows restoral of access privileges. All Mind provides a combat training simulator to support its mercenaries. Your license was in a suspended state. Perhaps you may need a refresher. As an added incentive, completion of the exercises will be rewarded with AC parts. You stand to benefit regardless. That's how the big bad main villain of the entire story is introduced to the player, as if she's nothing more than a tutorial bot, as a basic game mechanic. Something you'd barely pay any attention to, something that you wouldn't expect to have any effect on the plot. This is such a cool way to introduce a video game villain. For one, because it's so different from the way almost any other villain is presented in almost any other game. You usually know who the villains are when you see them. Or in the very least, you know that the villain is actually a character in the game. At this point, for all the player knows, All Mind could literally just be a tutorial. And of course, the name All Mind itself is already a bit suspicious. All Mind is a pretty grandiose title for just a background support AI. It reminds me some of how GLaDOS, another evil manipulative AI villain, is introduced in the game Portal. In a very similar way, at the start of that game, GLaDOS is just an AI voice, benignly guiding the player through a series of puzzles, explaining the mechanics of the game to you, cracking a silly joke here and there. It's not until you get pretty deep into the game that you'll begin to suspect that there's actually something very, very wrong with that seemingly benign AI voice. But another reason I find this intro so fascinating is because it does an excellent job of merging gameplay mechanics with the story. This is something From Software always does really well. For example, in a lot of their games, they will have a convoluted explanation for why the player character keeps coming back to life after being killed, which ties into the story in some ultimately really satisfying way. Armored Core 6 needs to have a tutorial. There are so many little mechanics that have to be explained to the player. Piloting these ACs is honestly a bit overwhelming at times. But someone at From Software was like, well, what if that tutorial was an actual character? And not just any character, but some kind of crazy Machiavellian super AI who is scheming to forcefully evolve all of humanity. It's really interesting writing. All Mind does have an ulterior motive in providing those training and combat simulation services to the player. She is searching for candidates for her Coral Release program. She needs to find a really strong AC pilot who she can manipulate. So she trains and tests new mercenaries, but we'll discuss that more later. In your first playthrough of the game, you will encounter All Mind on two more occasions, though you won't realize it either time. The first time is when you encounter the mercenary Sula at the watch point. This encounter can feel pretty random, like who is this guy and why is he here and why is he attacking us? But we'll answer those questions later. The second time is when you encounter these mysterious autonomous stealth mechs at the boss arsenal number two. These stealth mechs are operated by All Mind, though you won't know that yet. And she sent them here to wipe out the Rubicon Liberation Front garrison, because the RLF was using the arsenal to mine a nearly depleted little vein of coral. Because All Mind doesn't want any of the coral on the planet to be used up. For her coral release program, she needs as much of it as she can get her hands on. But again, more on that later. For now, all the player will know after completing this mission is that there is some other faction operating on the planet Rubicon, some secretive behind-the-scenes organization with mysterious motivations. In your second playthrough of the game, All Mind starts acting a little more suspicious. She opens up a new version of the arena specifically for Raven. Now let's watch a clip to hear how All Mind herself describes this new arena. Registration number RB23, call sign Raven. You have proven yourself to be truly exceptional, which brings us to a request. The integration program. 
This program concerns Mind Alpha, a pilotless AC that we have developed, sampling the various factions' machines to assimilate their technology and design philosophies. We would like you to engage it in arena combat to evaluate the accuracy of our model. Please, assist us with the future of All Might technology. Notably, she sends you this message directly after you defeat Sula, her champion. With Sula dead, she needs a new champion, a new trigger for her Coral Release project. And who better than the mercenary who just bested Sula in battle? This is the moment All Mind takes notice of the player, the moment when she begins trying to work Raven into her plans. I believe the true purpose of this integration program she describes here is to find a way to literally integrate herself with a human AC pilot, to sort of download or merge with that pilot, under the guise of simply trying to build a better autonomous mech and also to explore the possibilities and repercussions of the Coral Release program. After you finish this new arena in New Game Plus Plus, Air mentions something about how conflict is the key to evolution, and I think that's why All Mind conducts these experiments using arena battles. She needs that conflict to evolve herself. My evidence for this theory comes from the descriptions of the analysis program battles. A lot of them mention research into human augmentation, the human psyche, human psychology, and ideology, human perception. This one mentions research into the symbiosis between humans and their ACs, which is what happens to Iguazu at the end, when he is downloaded into that AC, which is also what All Mind tries to do to Raven in that final battle, to download him into an AC that she can control. This one mentions research into the biological analogies between humanity and coral, that the AC can be used as a catalyst for both life forms to evolve in symbiotic harmony, which is exactly what happens in the very final cutscene. Notice none of these descriptions mention anything about All Mind trying to dominate humanity or trying to take over the world. That's not her goal. Her true goal is evolution. She says so herself directly over and over again in these integrations program descriptions. And then later in the second playthrough, she attacks both you and Iguazu in the grid. Presumably this is an attempt to remove potential obstacles to her plans, or perhaps some sort of test. Moving on, All Mind doesn't play any more of a role in the second playthrough of the game, but she becomes the star of the show in the third. The third playthrough of the game features some significant changes, and all of those changes have to do with All Mind. She sends her mechs to destroy the Strider, the Rubicon Liberation Front's weaponized mining platform. She secretly hires Raven to defend the boss arsenal number two from the PCA, and even fights alongside us in the form of Kate Markson, who is really just an All Mind controlled automated AC. A lot of her missions here involve protecting Coral because, as previously stated, she needs as much of it for herself as possible. Moving on in the Attack on Watchpoint mission, Sula is joined by All Mind's stealth mechs, revealing that he and she are working together. Sula is actually only one of four different mercenaries that All Mind works with over the course of the game, all of whom are products of the first four generations of human augmentation. Here is Sula, one of the only survivors of first generation augmentation. Of course, there is Raven and Iguazu, who are both survivors of fourth generation augmentation. And finally, there is V3 O'Keefe, a survivor of second generation augmentation, who she tasks you with assassinating later on. All four of these characters characters are extremely powerful AC pilots, but why? Why does All Might need these pilots? Why can't she accomplish Coral Release on her own? With her army of automated mechs, why does she need humans at all? The answer to this question lies in this data log. It says, The arrival of ACs brought the age of unpiloted craft to an end, but what essential difference makes them superior? This log makes it clear that human piloted mechs are innately superior in performance to AI piloted mechs. But why is that? I don't know if there is any lore reason for this, but I do know the thematic reason for it. I know the narrative reason for it. And that is, Armored Core 6 is essentially a story about the supremacy of the individual will, the strength of human will. Armored Core 6 is a story about the power of the individual. It's a story where a single random person who fights hard enough, who has a strong enough individual will, who makes a hard choice and follows through with it to the bitter end, 
can change the tide of history. In order for that kind of story to work, humans have to be essentially superior to machines. You can't tell a story about the supremacy of the human will and then have an autonomous mech stomping all over human piloted mechs. Thematically, that just doesn't work. And this is the true reason why she needs Sula and O'Keefe and Iguazu and Raven. Why a super AI can't accomplish Coralise on its own. Why she needs a human as the trigger. Because Armored Core 6 is thematically a story where human will is supreme. Particularly, she needs humans with powerful individual wills, individual survivors, men and women who carve their own destinies, who make their own choices, who don't allow their will to be co-opted by some larger organization. I will leave it to the people who make lore videos to decipher the convoluted lore justifications for why she needs these pilots. Obviously, we know human augmentation involves being altered by coral technology in some way, and that early generation augments are able to harmonize and communicate with the coral consciousness in a way that later augments cannot. We also know that her coral release program requires three factors, one of which appears to be a huge, dense, massive coral, and the third of which appears to be a powerful early generation human augmented AC pilot. But this isn't really a lore video, it's a story analysis video about the themes of the story, how those themes are borne out by the character's actions, about the choices the writers made and why they made those choices. There is a difference between lore analysis and story analysis that I think people in the comments section don't always understand, but I'm digressing. Let's get back to analyzing the story of Allmind. Allmind stops operating in the shadows during the Xylem survey mission, when Raven is attacked by Father Dolmayan and tasked by Allmind herself with killing him. Okay, so what's happening here? Father Dolmayan is someone who, through coral dosing, made contact with the coral consciousness. The coral consciousness told him about the possibility of symbiosis between humanity and coral, which could be accomplished through something called coral release. And let's look at this data log. It says, if I cross this threshold, tragedy will befall the world of mankind. Yet if I do not, here I stand, too afraid to cast the die. This is a good opportunity to discuss the name Rubicon. Why did the writers choose that name? Why did they name this planet Rubicon? Well, the Rubicon River is a shallow river in northern Italy. In ancient times, it was significant because it marked the boundary between the Roman province of Cisalpine Gaul and Italy proper. By law, Roman generals were supposed to dispel their armies before crossing this river on their return home. You weren't allowed to march an army under your personal control into the city of Rome. Which is exactly what Julius Caesar, the guy who destroyed the Roman Republic, eventually did. Famously, upon crossing the Rubicon, he said, Alea e octa est, meaning the die is cast, which means we've rolled the dice. Whatever the result of that roll is, there is no going back. We cannot unthrow the dice. In reference to this moment, the phrase crossing the Rubicon has become an idiom which means crossing a point of no return. In this data log, Father Dolmayan is considering crossing a Rubicon of his own, a point of no return, triggering coral release, symbiosis with coral, the end of humanity as we know it, and the birth of a new life form. However, unlike Caesar, Dolmayan is too afraid to cast that die. Coral release, symbiosis, evolution are going to be destructive. Not all humans will survive this process. In fact, most of them probably won't. We know this because most humans humans don't survive first generation augmentation, and coral release is likely going to be something sort of like the entire human population of the galaxy suddenly undergoing forced human augmentation all at once. This is why Dolmayan attacks us at Xyla. He knows we have the potential to trigger coral release and he wants to stop it, to save lives, to keep humanity human. This is the same reason why O'Keefe betrays Allmind. In his dialogue, O'Keefe talks about how, okay, sure, humanity sucks, being human sucks. There's a lot of suffering in this world, but he believes it's better to suffer as a human than to take the risk of destroying that humanity to become something else. However, as I discussed in depth in my Armored Core 6 analysis video, another major theme of this story is the need for change, for adaptation, even if that change is painful. Because life is change, change is inevitable. Those who resist change will ultimately stagnate, wither, and die, which is 
is exactly what happens to Father Domain and his Rubicon Liberation Front, and exactly what happens to O'Keefe, too. I've seen some historians justify Julius Caesar's actions during the Roman Civil War by saying that the Roman Republic was dying anyway. The Roman Republic was collapsing. To survive, the Roman state needed to be transformed into something new, even if that transformation was destructive and painful. And we can try to justify all minds actions in the same way. Perhaps humanity needs to change in order to survive. Moving forward, eventually All Mind takes the player under her protection. When I first played this mission, I thought for sure this was going to be some kind of devious trick. That All Mind wasn't going to really protect us. That she was going to trap us or kill us or something. But she doesn't. She doesn't trap Raven. She doesn't kill Raven. She actually does protect the player character. This is another of the reasons why I believe All Mind is a benevolent villain. If she was just a power mad, murderous, malfunctioning AI along the lines of a Shodan, or a GLaDOS, or a HAL 9000, she would have killed us here. But she doesn't. And not just because she needs us, but because I don't think All Mind wants to kill random humans for no reason. She only kills those who pose obstacles to coral release. She wants humanity to evolve, not to just go extinct. And now, let's fast forward to our final confrontation with All Mind. Let's watch the cutscene that precedes this final battle. Look. The coral siphoned by the corporations is beginning to resonate. Augmented human C4621. Raven, your role has come to an end. I've been waiting for this freelancer. I became part of this monster, so I could crush you. This time, you will die. When I first saw this cutscene, I was like, wait, what the fudge? This guy? This freaking total whiny loser of a character is the final boss of the whole game, Iguazu? Freaking Iguazu? This must be some kind of joke. Except it is not a joke. The writers are being very serious, and they do have a meaningful reason for choosing Iguazu for this role. So to understand that meaning, we have to rewind all the way back to the start of the game to follow Iguazu's story from introduction to finale in the same way we followed All Mind's story, to examine how his character is written and developed, and try to understand this baffling decision by the writers who chose this character out of this game's massive roster of much more impressive characters to play the role of final boss. Iguazu has relatively limited appearances in the game. He does not show up very often, which is part of the reason why it's so surprising that that he ends up being the final boss, and in his limited appearances, he never seems particularly menacing or powerful or mysterious or any of those qualities you would usually associate with a video game final boss. Iguazu becomes the final boss in spite of who he is, rather than because of who he is. He's the final boss more by chance than by intention. The more powerful characters are all either already fighting for their own personal causes, like the Overseers or Michigan or V2 Snail or Thumb Dolmayan, or they get killed along the way like Sula. All Mind chooses Iguazu because he just happens to be the last man standing, not because he's the strongest man standing. He's the last decent AC pilot around who she can manipulate, whose motivations sort of vaguely line up with her own. But let's actually follow his story from start to finish. Iguazu first appears in the mission Attack the Dam Complex, where Raven fights alongside two members of the Balaam Industries private AC squad. Iguazu spends most of the mission whining and complaining like the stupid little baby that he is. He's all like, why do I have to babysit some freelancer? Then, after proving yourself in the missions and even receiving a slight compliment from the Red Gun's commander, Michigan, Iguazu sends you a whiny direct message, which we're gonna listen to now. <laughs> you got lucky, Merc. You were the only warm body they could find. The Red Guns are going to be first over the wall. Have fun watching from the sidelines. 
My first response after hearing this was, okay, whatever, I don't care. Iguazu comes off as truly kind of pathetic in his introduction. He's whiny, he keeps mouthing off and bragging, he seems to feel personally insulted that someone nearby succeeded at something instead of him. He seems even more pathetic a little bit later since totally off screen. The red guns completely fail to scale that wall. They get their butts kicked, and it's such a minor and unimportant event to the overall plot that the game doesn't even really draw any attention to that failure at all. Raven successfully climbs the wall instead and gets all the glory, while Iguazu is totally forgotten by everyone, by both the player and the game. He doesn't show up again until many hours later during the attack on the Ice Worm, when, after complaining about how destroying the Ice Worm will be too difficult, he gets assigned to the mission. And again, during the mission, he's just whining and complaining the whole time. He's like, I'm not here because I want to be. And even when Rusty manages this totally crazy and badass railgun shot, Iguazu still has this crappy attitude of, Puh, the freak actually did it. He's a completely unlikable character. Iguazu appears one final time in the first playthrough. He is assigned the task of ambushing Raven down in the depths of the watch point. It's not a particularly hard or notable fight, and he goes down pretty easy. He complains of hearing voices here, which is of course him making contact with the Coral Consciousness, something that seems to greatly distress him. But there's this moment during the fight when he yells out, I know you're laughing at me, what makes you so special, Freelancer? Iguazu's core character traits are insecurity and jealousy, and these are such toxic, acidic emotions. These are the sorts of emotions that can just eat away at you inside. Insecurity is one of the least attractive traits that anyone can have. When you are as deeply insecure as Iguazu is, that insecurity colors everything you say and do. Everyone can hear the insecurity in your voice, which of course only makes the insecurity worse, causes you to feel certain that everyone is judging you and criticizing you, which you can hear in Iguazu's dialogue every time he speaks, but especially that line, I know you're laughing at me. Insecurity and jealousy drive all of Iguazu's actions, like in the second place playthrough when he attacks you in the grid, or later when he actually hires a mercenary to kill you since he can't do it himself, or when he attacks you in the Institute City ruins and then attacks Snail too. He is deeply, bitterly jealous of Raven's success, and has no real confidence in his own abilities, which causes him to whine and complain and show off. He needs to defeat Raven, firstly so he can stop feeling that jealousy which is eating him up inside, but also so he can stop feeling so insecure to prove himself to himself. In some ways, I do think Iguazu is a sympathetic character. He is surrounded by all of these totally incredible AC pilots, who are all so much more interesting and so much more confident and so much more powerful than he is. Of course he would be jealous, that's a totally natural and normal reaction to being surrounded by people who are better than you. But what's not normal, and definitely not healthy, is letting that jealousy totally take over your life the way Iguazu allows it to. Like, it sucks to be an AC pilot in a story where Raven, the player character, exists who just wins every single battle, who is totally unbeatable. But the thing is, all of us are living in a world with a raven. Whatever it is that you're good at, somewhere out in the world, there is a raven. Someone who is so much better than you, has so much more natural talent, is so much more successful that you can never hope to catch up. Actually, there are probably a lot of ravens out there. Most of us just aren't ever going to be the best at anything. And that's not fair, and it is frustrating but you have to just chill out and focus on the things that you are good at. Focus on being as good as you can be, because that's hard enough. That's enough of an accomplishment without attempting to be as good as the best of the best. That's what turns Iguazu into a villain. He has no chill. He wants to be the best, but he's just not good enough. It's only by random chance that he gets noticed by All Mind, and that she has no other candidates left who she can manipulate. I don't think she allies with him until after he fails to defeat Raven and Snail in Institute City. I think up to that point, he plays no part in her plans. He abandons the Red Guns on his own without any promise of power, searching for a way to destroy Raven, who he has come 
to despise. Of course, Iguazu doesn't care about All Mind's plans. All he wants is the power to destroy Raven, which he thinks he's found by merging with All Mind. Iguazu is really interesting as a final villain because he's kind of just a normal guy. He's just someone who is so insecure and so jealous and so bitter that these toxic emotions manage to rocket him all the way to the very end of the story, past the deaths of so many more powerful characters along the way. Except he does have one truly powerful moment during this final fight, one genuinely impressive moment where Iguazu shows off that perhaps, if he could only let go of his jealousy and insecurity, he may have actually had more potential than he realized. But before we discuss that, let's watch the next to last cutscene, when All Mind and Iguazu's stories fully merge. to the plan. Irregulars. We will bring order to chaos. Notice the way All Mind's voice has merged with Iguazu's in this scene. I think that's meant to represent the way in which his will has been totally subsumed by hers. He has been very literally absorbed by All Mind. But remember, this is thematically a story about the supremacy of the individual free will, of the strength of human will. In a contest between the will of a man and the will of a machine in this sort of story, man will always triumph, which is exactly what happens. During the fight, Iguazu breaks out of All Mind's control. He disrupts both All Mind and the Coral Consciousness just by the strength of his will alone. I think this is the reason why the writers chose Iguazu to be the final boss of the whole game, to give this kind of character this kind of moment. Even this insecure, jealous loser, even Iguazu, if his individual will is strong enough, he can be powerful. He too can change the course of history. It wouldn't be as remarkable or as memorable of a moment if this was done by any character other than Iguazu, if this was anyone who is less of a loser than him. It is specifically because he's such a loser that makes him the perfect character to demonstrate this theme of strength of will in the end. Of course, it's still not enough. He still gets beaten by Raven because this is an action video game, and the player character gets to win the final fight. And that's the end of Iguazu's story. He was a loser, and he only reached this point by basically random chance. But thanks to the strength of his will, even he got one small moment to shine. But all all Mind's story actually continues past this point, at least for a few more moments. So to end her story, let's watch the final cutscene in the game. Our plan. Humanity. Creation's potential. We have the trigger. And we'll pull it ourselves.
The coral has carried us, disseminated us across the stars. Now, we're everywhere, anywhere. Raven, let's meet this new age together. What's happening here is that Coral has reached a critical point. It is reproducing at an exponential scale, and so becoming more and more dense, until it becomes so dense that it collapses into a sort of black hole, then explodes outward like a supernova, in an explosion so massive, it apparently spreads across the entire galaxy, presumably causing Coral to spread and bond with all humans everywhere, killing many of them and those it doesn't kill, it simply symbiotically evolves with into a new life form. These new human coral symbiotes awaken in the last scene, using ACs as bodies. All of this speaks to that theme of evolution and change I discussed in my story analysis video, so I don't want to repeat any of that here. Instead, I want to stay focused on All Mind. The really interesting thing about All Mind as a villain is that you don't actually stop her plan. Her plan was to use Raven and Air to trigger a coral release, which they do anyway. I mean, sure, they stop her from absorbing or downloading Raven and Air, but otherwise they carry her plan out exactly as she intended. This is really rare for a villain. Protagonists don't usually defeat a villain, and then turn right around and complete their unfinished projects for them. All Mind didn't even need to attack Raven. Raven was perfectly willing to do what she wanted. This is the flaw within All Mind's character. Like a lot of other AI and a lot of other stories, she has this need to be in total control over the situation, a superiority complex. She can't just let Raven choose to trigger the coral release on his own. She has to download his consciousness, subsume his will within her own, and then do it herself. But did she really have to destroy the Strider? Did she really have to slaughter the RLF garrison at the boss arsenal? Did she really have to kill all of the people she killed in order to carry out this plan? I mean, sure, some of those deaths definitely were necessary. Like, the overseers were never just gonna sit back and let her do this. The PCA had to be forced out of the picture as well. But I think a lot of this killing is just her trying to take more control of the situation than is actually necessary. All Mind could have walked into this new future hand in hand with the humans she wished to support, but she didn't just support, she tried to take control. And in a story about the supremacy of human will, she was always going to fail. Except she still succeeds in the end, in every way that matters. She did what she wanted, she triggered a dramatic evolution. Humanity will never be the same, the galaxy will never be the same. That's thanks to All Mind. If this evolution truly is a good thing, if abandoning our humanity and embracing embracing a new future is a good thing, then All Mind wasn't really a villain at all. She was more of a misguided caretaker, fulfilling her ultimate function, which was to support independent mercenaries, to guide them towards their best possible future. Of course, there is another perspective here. All Mind also laid the groundwork for humanity's extinction. If you think there is something special and unique about being human, something worth preserving and even celebrating, well, All Mind destroyed all of that. Humanity as we know it is gone forever in this ending. Either way, this is one of the most ambiguous endings from software has ever written. And All Mind and Iguazu remain one of the most fascinating villain pairings anywhere in video games. The over-ambitious support AI that triggers a new galaxy-wide evolution, and the jealous, insecure loser who is just never good enough. There are few bedfellows stranger than these anywhere in fiction. 